Okay, so uh, let us continue with a study of game playing. And we saw in the last class a notion of a strategy and a strategy is constructed by making one choice for max considering all choices for min and then one choice for max and then all choices for min. So, you can say that solving a game tree means discovering an optimal strategy. We have said that the value of a strategy is minimum of value of leads. Yeah, assuming that we are talking in this minus 1, 0, 1 valuation, where 1 stands for win for max, 0 stands for draw and minus 1 stands for a loss for max. And if once max has chosen the strategy, then the value of the strategy is the lowest value from the leaves in the strategy. Remember the strategy is a subtree and whatever the values that the leaves are, the minimum of those is what the value of the game will be. And assuming that the opponent is perfect and we are assuming that the op opponent is perfect. Now, if you look at an and or graph, we viewed a solution in an and or graph if you look at what a solution is. At all level you have to choose one, we have to make one choice and at and level you have to make all choices. So, if for example, if there were you had three choices here then at all level you will choose one choice, the solution would be like this and if this was an AND node, you would have to solve for all three and then if this was an OR node, then you would again make a one choice. So, you can see a similarity between AND OR trees and game trees. In AND, in and OR trees, if you had an AND node, you had to solve all the three, all the, all the sub problems emanating from there. If you had an OR choice, you could choose any one of them essentially. So, a MAX node is like an OR choice because MAX can choose any one essentially, but MAX has to encounter for all of MIN's choices. So, a MIN node is like an AND node essentially. The difference is that the value of the solution is in this case a sum of the values of cost of these three nodes, solving these nodes. In this case, it is the minimum of the cost of these nodes actually, because it is a min node sitting here. If this was minus 1, this was 0, this was minus 1 and this was 1, then min would select minus 1. So, it is a minimum of this value. You can see that this is also consistent with our logical notion of AND. AND always chooses a minimum. So, if A and B if A is false, then the whole thing becomes false essentially. So, AND also in some sense chooses the minimum value or chooses the maximum value essentially. Hmm? So, there is clearly an analogy between AND or trees and game trees. Of course, game trees have a very well defined layered structure, which we can always impose on some AND or problems, but we have an algorithm for solving AND or trees, which is the AO star algorithm. So, my question is can we use the AO star algorithm to solve the game tree? What do we want? We want a strategy of optimal value. In this case, there are only three possible values 1, 0 or minus 1. So, if there is a winning strategy, we want it. Otherwise, we want a strategy which will draw the game. Otherwise, we are forced to accept a losing strategy. So, can we use the AOSA algorithm here? There is also there is an analogy in the Andor graph, the solved nodes are nodes which have a label attached to them and leaves also have a label attached to them. In some sense, the similar backup procedure is taking place in AO star, if you remember the algorithm essentially. In the forward phase, we expand the search tree a little bit and in the backward phase, we back up the values, which is very similar to the backup values that we are using here. 
except of course, that here we are choosing min and max, there we are just summing up the values. Okay. So, the answer to this is actually yes, we can use the AO star algorithm provided we have access to the complete game tree. And why is that not always a feasible thing? Let us look at the game of chess, which has been the game which has fascinated most programmers or computer scientists essentially. Now, If you count the size of a tree as the number of leaves, which means each leaf is a different game that you can, you can play. Right? Every path that you can take in the, in the game tree is a game and the leaf is the outcome of that game. So, the number of leaves is in some sense a measure of the size of that game tree. Essentially. So, let us try and estimate. Of course, the, that the tic tac toe or cross and knots is a simple uh, computationally a simple game because at one level you have nine choices assuming that you you cannot uh, distinguish between symmetric situations let us say you have nine choices here then eight choices at the next level seven choices and so on it's a very not a very large game tree essentially, which is not surprising because we have figured out by now that it is the value of the tree is a draw essentially. What about the chess game tree? As I said uh, at the max first level there are 20 choices. So, those of you who know chess will agree with me 8 pawns, 8 pawn moves with one step, another 8 pawn moves with two steps and 4 knight moves uh, for the 2 knights essentially. So, 20 at the first level and as a, as you start playing the game, the game sort of board opens up and more moves are possible. So, for example, bishops can start moving, rooks can start moving, the queen can start moving and the number of the branching factor in some sense increases as you go towards the middle game essentially. So, chess players tend to categorize the game into opening, middle and end game. So, towards the middle game, it is the most complex part of the game. So, people say that on the average B is equal to 35, that on the average a chess game has 35 moves that a player has to choose from essentially and on the average a typical game is 50 moves long. So, average game. Of course, some games get over earlier, some games can long lasted and so on, but just to get an idea of the size of this game tree. So, you can see that you can one big estimate is that the number of games possible is 35 raised to 50. So, if the branching factor was constant 25, then you can 35, then you can see the top level 35 moves, then another 35 moves for each of those moves and so on. So, since it is 50 moves long, 35 raised to 50, which is equal to about 10 raised to 120. Hmm. Which means of course, just to dramatize the point, if I started writing this and I label the zeros, this is the first zero, this is the second zero, this is the third zero and I will have to keep writing to the end of the board till I write the 120th 0 essentially. We have already discussed this kind of numbers before that this is not a number you can trifle with. There is no hope ever of solving the game tree completely, chess tree completely uh, and in fact, we do not, we have not been able to solve it still now even though people are putting massive computing power towards solving game trees and they are using very sophisticated techniques like analyzing the end games and creating up lookup tables for them and then using those to solve the game trees and that kind of stuff. Checkers incidentally, I do not know, 
if you remember when we went through this progress in computer science that sometime in this century 2005 or something I do not remember exactly the game of checkers was solved. So, it was known what the outcome of the game is and this was done through use of massive amount of computing power and checkers is a much smaller game because the choices available for each piece are very limited essentially. So, if you know the game you can only move in one of two directions one step or sometimes you can jump over others and so on. It is a much smaller game in terms of the size of the game tree and that we have just managed to solve. Chess is practically impossible. If you remember the kind of numbers we were talking about 10 raise to 75 is the number of fundamental particles in the universe and then if each of them was a supercomputer, So, you can do that argument again and you can see that you can in effect not solve the game at all. So, we, we do not know whether why it will always win in chess or not which is why the game is still interesting as opposed to cross and knots which we do not want to play because we know that it is always a drawn game essentially. So, if we do not have access to the leaves then how can we use this algorithm we cannot use the algorithm. So, we have to do some other approximation and which is what we will look at essentially which are kind of variations of AO star you might say. While I am talking about games the most complex game in terms of the size of the game tree is a game called Go. I do not know how many of you have heard about it. It is a game which is extremely popular in Japan and and size of the and a feeling of the complexity of the game can be got by the fact that it is played on a 19 by 19 board and you can place it is a game in which you place coins on uh, one on top of the not one at, so there are specified locations at, at cells you can place points and you can imagine that in the first move you can place it in any of those 19 by 19 locations and then so on. So, it is a huge game in in in, in that terms. Go is something that we have not been able to program well by we mean the whole com computing community has not been able to produce good go playing pro programs. And the people who talk about go they say that no you have to use other techniques like pattern recognition by pattern recognition I mean you know uh, trying to make out which board positions are good and which board positions are not good essentially. Some people use the word zen with go and so on. So, so games can be quite com so, so go is much more complex than chess in terms of the size of the game tree which and we can really not do much with that essentially. One game that is of interest to us is a game called Othello also called as reverse C and we have been using that for the last few years for the game competition and we will do so this year also. So, maybe you should go and look up the game. The idea of the game is that uh, it is played on a chess board like board except that it is a single color board and we start off by playing uh, two kinds of coins. So, which let me say I am representing by knots and crosses like that game, but in practice it is like red coin and white coin and things like that. So, let us say cross stands for red coin and this stands for white coin. This is the initial position of the game in the center of the board and a move you a move is made by capturing opponent pieces which means that if I have a piece coin here I can place a coin here and in the process I have captured this piece essentially which means this piece becomes actually my piece. So, I have made one move and this is a game then it is opponent's turn. So, opponent can also do something similar. So, opponent can for example, put a coin here and then this is captured back in some sense. Then I can place a coin here and capture this back again mm -hmm. and the game sort of goes on. So, if I if the opponent were to put a coin here then at then he would simultaneously capture this and this essentially. So, both will get captured because by placing a coin here you are enclosing one end you have this and this end you have this and this end you have this. So, both in both directions you can. 
So in all, so you can capture in four directions, and if you you can make multiple captures in one move, but you can you are allowed to place only one coin on the board. And essentially, the game ends when either one side cannot make a move. Uh, all every all, all the coins have been placed on the board, so it's it's not uncommon for the board to be almost completely filled up. And you win the game if you have more coins on the board at the end of it. But we will also give you a score as to how many points you have won by essentially. So if it's a massive win, so let's say an eight by eight board, you have sixty point coins and the opponent has four coins, then you have a big win essentially. Whereas if you have thirty and the op opponent has thirty four. Then he has a smaller win. So that's a game that we will use for the competition. You'll have to write a program which will compete against other people's programs. So how do we play a game which whose so whose tree we cannot access essentially? So we do what humans would do. Is that we do a partial look ahead? Hmm? So, in most game playing programs, you do a limited look ahead, which means that if my tree looks like this, okay, this is max. Then instead of search, so I've drawn it as a practically an infinite tree growing exponentially. We cannot explore this tree. So, what do we do? We cut off at some level. This some people call as the horizon. You cannot see beyond that. And <coughs> this is called the number of plies. So, this is k ply if the if the depth is k. So instead of searching the entire game tree, I mean, if you had the complete game tree, then you could have just backed up the values, and you would have found the minimax value and the best move for max in the process. But we don't, we cannot search the game tree because we have seen that they can be really, really huge. So we 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 decide that we'll do a limited look ahead and try to try to decide what is the move. Now, incidentally. That's how human beings also tend to play. At least the beginners, that's how they tend to play. They do a limited look ahead, maybe two moves ahead or three moves ahead, but they don't do a complete look ahead in the sense they don't look at all possibilities. So most chess players, for example, would not even consider all the twenty moves that you can make at the starting point. They would have a fancy for two or three different possible moves. So either this pawn opening or that pawn opening or something like that, and they would only explore that. So we do a limited search, in the sense that we don't look at the complete branching factor. We only look at a few possible moves, and a few possible replies by the opponent, and a few possible moves that I can make there. And in some sense, our search is incomplete essentially. Of course, expert chess players tend to do more exhaustive search. They also tend to. Be able to judge positions. So let's so let me introduce that idea at this moment. That if you are doing a limited look ahead, what is the use? Because the nodes that you are going to look at this level, they are not completed games. They are sort of halfway played games. If you have made a few moves. Opponent has made a few moves. And based on this look ahead, you want to decide what you want to play essentially. So what do we do? We have to write algorithms to give values to these nodes. So what do we do? We apply a evaluation function. So again, those of you who might have played chess sometimes or watched other people play chess, then you can hear comments like, yeah, this is a good position for white or something like that, or white is winning. 
So, white is not yet won, but you look at it and say oh it looks like white is winning. Now, instead of making such qualitative statements, we want to give quantitative values. So, we want to define a function which is an evaluation function, which will give us a value for the board position. Okay. Now, what do we do instead of this 1, 0, minus 1, those 3 values which are available to us when the game ends, instead of that we break it up into a larger range. So, typically it is let us say minus 1000 to plus 1000. So, the evaluation function returns us a value in this range, which the understanding that plus 1000 is equal to the original 1, minus 1000 is equal to the original minus 1 and all values in 0 is equal to the original 0, which means both sides are roughly equal. But the actual number tells you how good it is for max or how bad it is for max. So, if it is plus 70, it is a little good for max. If it is plus 700, it is much better for max and if it is minus 600, it is quite bad for max. So, we try to look at a board position and give it a value, give it a number. Now, obviously, this means different kind of reasoning and in some sense it involves the use of knowledge about the game essentially. So, you should be able to look at a game board position and give a number essentially. So, if we can now apply the evaluation function to each of these nodes on the horizon, which is where our search ends, then we can apply the same minimax backup rule to evaluate the value of this game. So, the backup rule that we said that at mean level choose the lowest value from its successors and at max level choose the highest value from the successors. So, we can back up these values and determine what is the value for that and in the process also decide what is the best move to make essentially. Now, clearly the performance of this algorithm will depend upon how good your evaluation function is. Because if, if your evaluation function is good, then it will tell you which of the board positions are better. Now, ideally we would like to have a perfect evaluation function, which in a game like Go people have tried to do is that you look at all the choices and apply the evaluation function here. So, we will call this function E and let us say E of j, where j is a node. So, we apply E of j here. Ideally, we should just, just look at all the options and see which one leads to a better move it, and then make that claim. But in practice, evaluation functions are never perfect, they are like heuristic functions, you know you are making some judgment and arriving at some number that may not be accurate. So, in practice, it has been observed that a combination of evaluation and look ahead does reasonably well for games. So, this is a situation where there is no look ahead except that at this level you are just looking at the choices you have and picking the best based on evaluation function. Here you are saying I will look at my choices first, then I will look at what the opponent can place in that position and so on and I will keep doing that to some k ply depending on how much computing power I have. go up to the ks play, apply the evaluation function there and then back up the values. So, in some sense what will happen is that, that some things will get captured in the look ahead. So, again if I use the analogy of chess, then if you are doing you are capturing the opponent's rook and the, op and the opponent is capturing your bishop or something then at least those things are known that these pieces are going away. So, the absence of an evaluation function is compensated by doing more look ahead essentially. Typical chess playing programs that you get on laptops for example, would do something like 8 
apply or something like that. Uh, and generally, you can imagine that with this kind of branching factor, uh, the number of games that you have to look at is growing exponentially. And people have surmised that if you do 16 ply look ahead for chess with a reasonably good evaluation function, then you can play at a grandmaster level essentially. So, it is a surmise. In practice, of course, we do not do such simple searches. We will see that sometimes we do a little bit more search in some areas and so on and so forth. Okay. So, what is the game playing algorithm we want to write? See, we want to still win the game. We do not want to make some move and say it is a good move essentially. So, the game playing algorithm that we will use is, so let us just call this k ply search we will have an loop in which we will say do k ply search and then make a move and then get opponent's move and we will put this into a loop till the game ends. So, what are we doing now? If the game tree were something that we can explore completely, we would have analyzed the whole game tree once for all and said this is a strategy and it is a winning strategy and then you just play it according to that strategy. But the game tree we are not able to access and what we are doing now in this algorithm is that at every move you are doing a search. Every time you have to make a move you do some search, limited search, k ply search and then decide based on that. So, what, what does this amount to? This amount to saying that if you make a choice here, let us say this is your game tree and you do a search let us say up to this ply depth which means you make a move based on this much search. So, this is your move then you wait for opponent's move. So, opponent makes a move let us say opponent makes this move. So, you are here somewhere inside that original search that you did. Now, at this stage you do another search limited search again k ply search and then make your second move. So, let us say this is your second move then opponent makes a move then again you do a search. Okay. So, in this manner you can see that for every move that you are making you are doing a limited search essentially. What is the advantage of that? Is that as the game unfolds you are looking at those part of the tree which you had not seen originally. Originally you have seen only till this part of the tree and then after two moves you can see two plies deeper because you have made one move and the opponent has made one move then your search will now look a little bit deeper then again here another two plies deeper and so on. So, as it goes along you are looking at different. So, all that remains to do is to write this k ply search algorithm that is the simplest of game playing algorithms. We will see how to improve upon that in the following classes. Okay. So, let me first write the algorithm it is a very simple algorithm minimax it is called minimax and it takes a node j as an argument and it returns the minimax value essentially. So, let us say this algorithm only computes a minimax value and, and on the process you can put in a small routine which will tell you what is the best move that is a secondary thing which comes out of it essentially. And roughly the algorithm is as follows. So, let us assume that you have a way of testing whether you are on the horizon or not essentially. So, you can have some kind of a count as you go searching into the tree essentially. So, I am assuming that you, you will somehow figure out how to do that and then we do the following if 
J is terminal So, J is a node and by terminal we mean a test which tells you whether you are on the horizon or not. If you are on the horizon, then we get V j is equal to E j. So, you simply apply the evaluation function and you get the value for that node. Else, it is not terminal for i is equal to 1 to b, where b is a branching factor, generate the j i, the ith child of j, then if i equal to 1, which means if you are looking at the first child, then V J Or let me use a slightly simpler this thing. Let us say something called val is the minimax value of Vj. If j if i is equal to 1, then Vj gets val as the first node, first child that you have looked at. Otherwise, you will update to a better child. Else, if j is max, then v j get max So, I just use this device because I do not want to write this. This is a recursive call notice, it is a recursive call with the next node. I just do not want to write it again and again. So, I am just writing it once. So, once I am making a recursive call and then if the first one of course, that gets the value, Vj gets that value. If it is not the first child, then you compare with the current value and this new value that you are getting. So, if it is max, it means that you have got some value here which is vj and you are looking at this child and you are getting a value vj let us say k which is returned by this. So, you are, you are going to return vj which is the minimax value of this node j. And so, this recursive call will return the minimax value of Vj. And then, as I scan from left to right, going I go going from 1 to b, I will keep seeing if I am getting a better value from the next call and so on. And wherever I get a better value, I will store that. So, it is a very simple algorithm which will look ahead k ply deep and compute the minimax value of that game based on the evaluation function. Okay because you are at the terminal level you are applying the evaluation function. And I am assuming that you will augment this with being able to select what is the move that max should make because that is really the task that you are doing right. That you do this much search and this algorithm is basically doing this search here in this area, but you want to make the move also. So, you must keep track of what where the best move came from actually. So, you must keep track of that. Then you will make the move, wait for opponent's move, and then again make a call to Vj to decide what is the next move you should make. So, this is the simplest of all algorithms. 
what is the nature of this search? Can you tell me what kind of search is this doing? It is searching this part of the tree, right? Game tree. Or in, if you look at this diagram, it is searching this part of the game tree. But in what manner is this searching? Depth bounded. Depth first. Depth first. Depth bounded, yes, because we are doing k play. But within that bound, how is it searching? In it is doing depth first search. Yeah, so you should figure out that this is really doing depth first search. Which of course gives us a clue as to this may not be the best way of looking at things. So, in the next class, of course, we will try to improve upon this. Uh, next, maybe one or two classes. But uh, in the remaining time, today, which is about 5 minutes or so, I want to just spend a little bit of time on this evaluation function. How do you write an evaluation function for a board position? Okay, because it is the performance of the algorithm really depends on how good the evaluation function is. If it, if it can judge accurately the value of a board and by accurately you mean whether it is you know how close to winning it is essentially, then just one ply search would be enough essentially if you have a very good evaluation function. But as I said in practice it is not so easy to get very good evaluation functions. So, what goes into an evaluation? So, essentially you want to look at a board position, let us say we are talking about chess, but in practice of course, when you do you will be doing Othello, but you look at a board position and you want to give it a value between minus 1000 and plus 1000 essentially or minus large and plus large let us see. Any ideas of how you could give this number? Many games wherever it wins backtrack and keep assigning then keep it in yeah, a but you see the whole point of this exercise is that we are trying to our search problem is so huge that we cannot search the game tree how do you play many games maybe initially begin with random assignment and based on once you reach the end, okay, okay. I can assign. So, I get your point. You are trying to say that, so you, you are a machine learning enthusiast and you are saying that I want to learn the evaluation function. Hmm. That is, that will come. In fact, Samuel Checker's playing program improved its game because it improved its evaluation function on the way. But that comes afterwards essentially. Before that, what are the components of the evaluation function? I mean, or in, or in machine learning terms, what is the structure of my evaluation function? What, what am I learning? Am I learning parameters or weights? Weights of what essentially? Okay. So, if you look at Tom Mitchell's book, the first chapter, he actually describes how a game playing program can learn evaluation function, but then he gives it a linear combination of I think he is talking about che checkers of number of pieces I have and number of pieces opponent has, number of kings I have, number of kings opponent has and a linear combination of them is this thing. So, my, my question is more, more fundamental that if you were to write the evaluation function yourself, let us say you are a chess expert okay, and or let us say you have Vishwanath Anand, Anand sitting next to you and you say help me write this evaluation function, what would he say? Uh, pieces should have particular value and then add them up. Hmm. And there will be positional advantage. Piece advantage. Yeah. So, typically an evaluation function will have two components. One is called material and the other is called positional. So, chess players will say oh white is winning because white has material advantage which means you know white has got let us say one rook and one bishop extra and then any good chess player will say okay if you have that much more fighting power I am not going to play against you or rather you would resign essentially. 
So, one thing is material, number of pieces you can say sum of now sir, now beginning chess players might say that you know a queen has value 9 and a bishop has value 5 or 3 or 4 or whatever I do not know rook has value 5 and then you count how many pieces do I have what is their value and let us say you give negative value to opponent's pieces and from that I subtract how many pieces the opponent has. So, if I have more pieces or more valuable pieces than the opponent then, my, then this sum will become positive essentially. Initially as you can guess both sides have the same number of pieces the value of material value is 0 both have the same number of pieces, but as you capture some pieces your material value goes up essentially. Now, in practice of course, uh, chess playing people have much finer gradation of values. So, they compute in thou in hundreds for example, let us say bishop is 200 and knight is 220 or something like that. It really depends on your perspective of the game essentially. So, one is the material value how many pieces I have and how many pieces opponent has. The other is positional which says how are the pieces arranged. Now, this is of course, the trickier part essentially this is the more difficult part because it is now looking at structure and not it is not just a matter of counting how many pieces I have how are they arranged essentially. So, chess players would say things like uh, if there are two rooks in the same. So, if, if this is a chess board for example, then if I have a rook here and if I have another rook here in the same column then chess players say that it is a stronger position two rooks in the same column are very powerful and you know you should try to arrive at such a position essentially or they might say that you know some pawn structures linked pawn structures if pawns are supporting each other it is better than pawns if they are scattered around the place and not supporting each other. Then you know that if there is a knight if n stands for a knight and if it is the opponent has a queen here and a rook here then you can see that knight is attacking both the queen and the rook at the same time. So, chess players call this a fork and a, and a fork is obviously a good thing to have essentially because it amounts to saying that in the next move I am going to either capture your queen or your rook. So, you are going to use lose material in the process essentially because queen and rook are important and knight is not so important in terms of material value essentially. And there are other things like controlling the center and attacking the center and things like that. Now, this program deep blue and when I read, read about this this was in 2002 or something like that it had a thousand components to positional evaluation. So, just as we said you know rooks in the same column or connected pawns or protected king or mobile pieces. So, you know a bishop is trapped then it is not very useful and things like that it has a thousand different components which were used to evaluate the board position in the positional part. So, that obviously is the key to the whole thing if you can look at a board position and give a value and this is just an attempt to give an accurate value it, it is looking at it piece wise it is saying this pattern is good this pattern is good this pattern is good and of course, if the opponent has that pattern you are going to subtract it from this. So, really the secret is in devising a good evaluation function if you have a good evaluation function then you do not have to search very much deep in the game and your evaluation function itself will tell you what is a good position or not. So, what you will need to do for your Othello game is to look at the game on the web or read, read up about it and try to devise an evaluation function because that is going to be a critical part of your program. Okay. So, today we have seen this that 
we cannot search the entire game tree, we have to do a limited look up, look, look ahead and we have a program to do k ply search and we will repeatedly call this program for the first move, for the second move, for the third move, for every move that we make we will call the program. And this simple version of k ply look ahead is essentially doing depth first search left to right and we want to improve upon that essentially. So, we will do that in the next class.